This is Transistor.fm. This is the much-anticipated Part 2 with Dan Martell of Clarity. If you haven't listened to Dan's crazy story in Part 1, rewind and listen to that first. But before we get into that, I want to tell you about some great sponsors. Sprint Lee has been with us since the beginning. Their web app is the best way to manage the software development process. It's what I use at work, and it's the first agile project management software that I've found actually works for us. You and your team can try Sprintly for free by going to www.sprint.ly. And if you're looking for dedicated WordPress hosting, use the host that I use, WP Engine. I've had five posts on the front page of Hacker News, and WP Engine handled all that traffic like a pro. We're talking 40,000 visits in a day. Big stuff. They also have great support. I highly recommend them. We've got a special deal. Go to productpeople.tv slash WP Engine and get up to two months free. Now, let's get to our interview with Dan Martell. Huh. I'd like to fast forward a little bit here and, and jump to Clarity. And I think what we'll do in this section is we'll use Clarity as uh, an example of some practical things that our listeners can, can do and, and use as they're building their own products. Uh, does that sound good to you? Sounds awesome. So let's talk about Clarity. It launched uh, about a year ago. How how did you get the idea? Well, you've talked a little bit about how you got the idea, but how did you get the idea, and how did you know that it was a good idea? Uh, I did, how did I know it was a good idea? Um, well, I get the idea after Floatown was acquired, um, like any time you get any press, I started getting emails from people I didn't know asking me to, you know, pick my brain, have coffee. And maybe it's the Canadian in me, but I just felt, I always respond to my emails. Any, you know, anybody's emailed me, I always respond, even if it's no or yes or like short, I do respond. And some yeah. of these people, like I actually wanted to, to help, but I, could, there was no way my ADHD would kick in. Like I couldn't read these lengthy business plans or you know, seven paragraph emails. So I had this need. I thought, well, I really like talking on the phone. What? I wish there was a way for me to like get their information and I would call them back. So I actually sat down one night and built a prototype that was a link that I could reply and say, hey, fill out this form, which was, you know, what do you want to talk about your name and your phone number? Mm -hmm. And when I'm free, I'll call you back. <laughs> and it was this, this, it was this app and I built on Twilio and like, I could just share a link. People could put their information. And then when I was free, I hit start calls. They would actually call me first and then read to me what the person wants to talk about and then dial them, you know, proxying my number. So they never got my cell. Yeah. And then we would talk. And then when they hung up, it would call, it would read to me what the next person wanted to talk about and dial them. No way. That's Yeah. That was clarity. That wasn't clarity's first tagline was the social call list manager. How, how long did it take you to build that, that first prototype uh, that worked? Two days. It was, <laughs> it was pretty much like it didn't have multi-user account. It was like you Facebook connect, right? Yeah. But Twilio makes it have all the APIs. All I did is I Facebook connected to the app. I put in my cell number and I got a URL that was based off my Facebook username, right? <laughs> Clarity.fm slash Dan Martell. And then on that URL was those three fields. And it would just build the list, which, I mean, if anybody's built a Rails app, it's, you know, you get that for free just running a command. And mm -hmm. then all I had to code was, all right, call me first. When I answer, read to me what they wrote and then call the person. And if they answer, let's talk. And if they don't or they hang up, go to the next person. And yeah. that was version one. And, the, the, you know, so I had it for like two weeks and I was using it in my email, right? People would email me and I would just reply and say, hey, put it here and I'll call you back. Mm -hmm. But it was really two weeks after I built the prototype that I went to the roof of my condo in San Francisco and, and it was like eight o'clock at night and I tweeted out like, do you need advice on your startup? Let's talk. Let me know. And then, <laughs> and then I started the calls and I spent two and a half hours talking to entrepreneurs all over the world. People, I, <laughs> people have been following me on Twitter for three or four years and yeah. I finally talked to them and it was just the most, I, I it was like this feeling of, this is what the internet was supposed to do. Yeah. 
like real conversations, not tweets and blog posts, but like, hey man, I, I've been following you for a while and I'm trying to figure out how to start my business. What do you think? And it was 10 minute conversations that I would assume, you know, they got some value out of it. And I, and I did like 30 of them in two hours. And I go, wow. if I, if I could unlock this for every person in the world, any person that, that had, you know, knowledge that other people wanted, if I could enable that for them to talk, that would be really impactful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I love about that, that story? This is something that Derek Sivers talks about is he says, you know, if you have, you get an idea for something, just do, what could you do like right away? That's the smallest version of that, that could prove whether there's some sort of demand there. And so it sounds like initially you were just taking phone calls, which is the tiniest version of that. Then you took two days to build this Rails app. Well, then what happened is people, yeah, so I know, I, I mean, I built the app, the, the Rails app with the phone calls was like a night or two, right? It wasn't yeah. hard. And then what happened is, is over the two week period, I would, I would just do the email. So nobody saw the link, but it's when I tweeted it out and my friends saw it, like Heaton and a bunch of guys, they all said, hey, can I use this? There you go. And that and that was when I think I think you know when you think it could be bigger, it's like you don't know how big it'll be, but if somebody asks to use this thing you built for fun to solve your own problem, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Right. How did how did you know, or did you think about whether people would pay for it? So what happened quickly was <laughs> once I put my email my link out there, everybody started using it. Yeah. So I, I had no control. Once it was out there, it's like my call list got unmanageable. Mm -hmm. so I actually had to, what I did is I built a paywall on the public call list, so the slash Dan Martell, but then I created what I call these, uh, these free calls that would be like slash whatever. So I could write like slash email VIP. And yeah. those were, they didn't have um, a paywall. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that, so I built the paid version just as the way to solve the other problem I then had, which was everybody knew my URL. And if you weren't stupid, you could figure out what Heaton Shaw's was and Andrew Chen's and Eric. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And they were testing it. I was watching it in my logs. Like, they had 404s. They were like, people were like, who else is on this thing? So um, <laughs> I added the paid for that. And I added the charity because a lot of these guys didn't want to look douchey and they didn't want to like charge for their time. So they figured, and that was, that was when I, I kind of, it really hit me that this is a big idea from a business point of view was the fact that, so if you think about in a charity component, it's like the charities need, um, they need help, right? They're not they're like business wise, you know, they don't, maybe they're not great internet marketers. So yeah. guys like me might have experience in internet marketing, but I don't have the time, yeah. right? but I have the advice. What they need is my advice plus money. So what I figured was like this trifecta was the, the, the nonprofit would get the money that the entrepreneur that needed the advice needed, they would pay and it would be win, win, win. Yeah. Huh. And, and I'm assuming that when you put up that paywall, people were, people started paying. Is that what happened? It, it was crazy. I don't want to talk about the numbers, but I mean, it, it, it was like, okay, there's something here and I walked away from, so what happened is I, I left demand for us to come acquire us after two months, you know, like I got acquired in October and I left in December and I pretty much walked away from half of my, you know, my outcome because I believed in clarity so much. And this was before I raised any money, but my bet was, could I create more value than the millions I would have got staying that in a year than, than going off and doing my own thing. And not only that, like I'm going to, what do I want my day to look like? Do I want to work on something I'm not passionate about or something that I can't sleep at night because I'm so excited about it? And so I made the bet, right? I felt like a big hypocrite if I wouldn't. And uh, <laughs> the cool part of that story was two things. Uh, two months later, I ended up raising $1.6 million on a very healthy valuation for Clarity. And uh, Demand Force got acquired by Intuit, accelerating investing all of my shares. So I ended up getting my earn out either way. Gotcha. Wow. So it was crazy. Yeah. I, so I don't, what, how that happened? I don't know. I, you know, somebody said, you know, the world rewards courageous decisions. And I yeah. honestly believe that like, that's <laughs> the only thing I can say to explain what happened in that one month period. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm just guessing like, what can you give us a sense of what you were seeing though? That, cause some people don't know what it's like to see a hit. Like what, what is it? What, what's it like to experience it? It's retention. 
Like this, this is, it's, it's really simple. It's not, you know, people call me up and they're like, yeah, I'm not sure if I should raise money. We just got 500 sales and we didn't do any marketing. And I'm like, that's not interesting because that means you don't know actually how to scale what just happened. You got 500 mm-hmm. sales. Why? You don't know. I don't know. You can guess, but that's not interesting. What I saw in the product and what I look at, you know, if I invested in 23 companies as an angel investor, um, and I always help with the growth hacking, growth marketing side of things, yeah. is great product retention. That when somebody uses it, they keep using it. And and if you can get a product that not only if they use it, they keep using it, but if they use it, it actually introduces the product to more customers, like Clarity, right? When when mm. somebody added themselves, it would, did take me long to say, okay, if you add yourself to my call list, then you created an account. Mm-hmm. Now you can do this. And it just kept going. And because the, the funny thing to me is that if I think a lot of people – uh, especially like our listeners, they're always trying to figure out what do people pay for. Mm-hmm. And if if you came to me and said, you know, I think people would pay to you know talk to the talk on the phone with people, I would say, well, you know, like that worked in the sex industry, but like it, it for it to work for businesses seems kind of crazy, you know. So, but you must have seen something really working when you tried it out. Well, I, I put the paywall as a filter, hoping that nobody, that people would stop doing it. Yeah. Right? But it turned out that people actually were willing to pay. <laughs> That's crazy. Right? And if you think about it, this is this is why I think it's really interesting. Now, do I think that do I like the business model? No. I, I would much rather something more social and interesting and filters and. You know, I don't. I don't like the fact that you got to pay because my whole thing was, how do you allow the 18-year-old version of me to get connected to somebody who'd been there before? Mm-hmm. I didn't have a credit card when I was 17, 18, right? So, mm-hmm. but it's been a great story since because now there's 16-year-olds that are borrowing their parents' credit card and they're doing, you know, 10, 15 calls. And we have a case study <laughs> on Clarity. This kid Raphael, he leaves his class in high school. He's 16. Yeah. To go do calls with experts. <laughs> <laughs> like, go read the case study. It's amazing. It's under customers. And I asked them when we were doing it, I was like, how did you get a credit card? You know, I, we actually say when you sign up, you agree that you're 18, but I don't really kick people off. Yeah. And he goes, I can parents that it was education. And they said, <laughs> as long as it wasn't more than, you know, $2,000, they were okay for me to do a call. And I'm like, I love this because what I thought would happen, even though it took a long time, it eventually did happen. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll put that link in the, the show notes. People can, can check that out on the site. Okay, so you figured out there's a business here, um, and you just touched on this, but so it sounded like you had another problem to solve because this is a two-sided market, right? You have to convince people to call, and you figured that part out. People wanted to call, and they were willing to pay for it, and it sounds like you had to figure out the other side of the market, which was um, – you know, getting entrepreneurs to take calls. Is that, is that true? Or were they willing to do it? I would love, so Justin, I would love to tell you that, you know, I, I hate doing these interviews because I know what people want. They want the success stories, right? They want to yeah. hear that flow town went from nothing to 50,000 businesses gets acquired and everybody made money. Like, yeah. and it, and it's true, but there was that part that, you know, which is we got shut down and had to build it up from scratch again. Yeah. Right. But nobody really wants to hear that when you're just telling the overview. So for me to sit here and say, oh, yeah, clarity day one, like I knew exactly what it was going to look like and it looks like what it is today. I'd be full of shit. I mean, the yeah. first version said social call list manager. What does that <laughs> have to do? I thought I was building a utility. I didn't even want to admit that I was building a two sided market yeah. for almost a year. It wasn't till December of last year, six, six months ago, that I finally said, all right, Dan, come to terms with it. There's two sides of the market. There's a supply and the demand. For the longest time, I was living in this utopia world of everybody can be an expert and anybody can be a member, and I don't want to discriminate. And if you're smart and people want your time, then that's okay. And it turns out to be a really shitty way to build a marketplace. <laughs> I love this. This is good. This is good honesty. And so yeah. so you had that realization. What what did you do with that realization? Well, there was, I mean, there's a couple more before that. I mean, we <laughs> didn't have search or directory for four months because a lot of the experts that signed up in the beginning built it. They, they signed up because they wanted the utility. They didn't want to have people searching for them. Mm. Right. So it was, it was like four months in, I said, okay, I was like doing customer interviews, people that visited the site and signed up and everyone that signed up said, I'm looking for advice. Where are the people? 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, well, that's not what clarity is about. And then I would do more customer interviews. And like 98% of conversations I had with people saying, I need advice. And I'm like, good luck. I'm not <laughs> going to tell you who's on here. Yeah. If you're smart, you'll go search Twitter, you know, or, tr- or hack away at our URLs. I mean, you could probably still find a cash version of our FAQ is like, how do I find extras on clarity? It's like, well, we don't have a search, but if you're smart, you can go first name, last name at the end and see if they're on clarity. Like that was our, it's ridiculous. Like, gotcha. I, did that for four yeah. I mean, so it was kind of like, I, you know, to me, what I did is what I've always done in business was, you know, I had a vision, right? I had like, here's what I want this thing to look like at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And I try and I put it in front of users and then I listened to what they were saying. Now I didn't react really quick and say, okay, they all want this, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't do that. I just listened and I listened and I listened. Some people think I listen fast and I move fast. I think I was a little slow to the, the, the draw, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it took me four months to build search in a directory. It took me another eight months to add scheduling for eight months. The way the product work is you would request to call at somebody and they would call you back whenever they wanted. Gotcha. <laughs> think about this. Think about going to my profile. Go, I want to talk to Dan. I'm going to request a call. Yeah. After it gets submitted, we're like, all right, stand by your phone. And he may call you at two in the morning when you're sleeping because he's in California and you're on the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that, that ridiculous? <laughs> 11 months, no scheduling. And were people still willing to use it though? Even though. Oh, for it, sure. Interesting. For sure. But it was, a, you know, when I realized what happened, here's what happened. It's an interesting product. Um, conversation is my personal preference on how I wanted my life to be managed was uh, got introduced to the product and what I mean by that is for the longest time I believe that having meetings scheduled all day meant you had no freedom Hmm. yeah so I never wanted to introduce scheduling now what changed in my life was I had a newborn son last August and all of a sudden I didn't have a choice to but have my day scheduled yeah and when I, when I was talking to my friend, he's like, dude, I really like clarity, but why, why do I have to, like, there's no scheduling. And I'm like, yeah, da, 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 da. and he's like, that's dumb, man. Like you should have scheduling. And I was like, no, but you don't understand. The experts are busy. And if I added scheduling, they probably wouldn't do it. And he goes, is that you or your experts saying that? And I was like, oh, that's me. Yeah. And that was interesting? That, was that the point of realization Someone that you trusted calling you out and saying, exactly. you've, you've got a blind I spot here? I mean, it, but why can't I schedule? And I'm like, people don't want that. He goes, no, I want it. I'm on there. And I'm sure if you ask people, they'd want it. It's you. That, and I was like, yeah, but experts are busy. He's like, this cannot work at scale. It's a shitty experience. And then what happened the next day is I, I used Clarity for Clarity. And I went and I found this guy I didn't know. And I wanted to, dude, there was no messaging in the product for a long time. Like all these <laughs> obvious things that you would expect a marketplace to have for a year was not there. And we were still making it work, but we weren't seeing the, another one. So, so let's say directory and search was one. The other one was scheduling. The other one was uh, anybody could be free or paid. So imagine you search in the directory and there's, you don't know who these people are. Some people are free and some people are paid. <laughs> That's weird. Like, yeah, why yeah. is this guy free? Why is this guy charging? Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah. So like it was it wasn't until December where we said, Okay, let's let's have let's just all agree as a team, I apologize, I screwed up. Like I really like I own a hundred percent. Yeah, I always joke with people that uh, I don't need engineers to be more productive. I just need to spend more time planning so I don't ask them to build shit that nobody wants. Because I think that's <laughs> the biggest waste. That yeah. is number one, the biggest waste. You don't need more designers than engineers. You need to stop building stuff that doesn't matter. Yeah, that means you have to really get your shit together. So, um, you know, so so those were like the big things in the product that I think if you if you as a founder or product person, you might not realize. You got to ask yourself like, what biases or, or beliefs do I have that are actually being reflected in the product that are not reflected in the customer's need? Mm-hmm. And it seems like one key there was having that friend that was willing to call you out, and the second that you mentioned was customer development, customer interviews. Uh, how, how do you do customer interviews? So I will, I will, I will throw out a challenge, not because I want to be cocky, but yeah. nobody on this listening does more customer development than I do. I really? In fact, I, oh, let's put some numbers behind it. Oh, I've emailed every single person that signed up for clarity, introducing myself and we're tens of thousands. I've done over 2000 calls through clarity. 
in the last 12 months. I do surveys, customer development surveys, on a weekly basis with my cohorts. I do problem, I have an email sent out to me every day with the new members and experts from the day before, and every afternoon I call three of each and talk to them. Oh, wow. I mean, no, nobody, nobody spends more time with their customers than I do. I do meetups in every city. I call them clarity pop-up sessions <laughs> when I'm traveling, and I invite my top 20 experts and 30 members, and I, I sit down and I ask them, like, what can I do to make clarity work better for you? And they show me, and I don't do any of it per se. I right away, I just listen. Hmm. And what's so, the what's the key to a good customer interview? What do people need to keep in mind? Don't sell. That was the biggest problem I had. My my co-founder Ethan at Flowtown used to call me Sell Martel. I, here's my customer development. Uh, so uh, I think you have this problem. Do you agree? No. Are you sure? <laughs> because I think. Have you ever done this? Well, yes. Well, then then you were trying to solve this problem. No. Maybe. Exactly. So you have this problem. What is that worth to you? What? <laughs> so you should buy because we have, a, you know what I mean? Like that is not how you do customer development. Yeah. What you do is you ask, you know, you ask questions like, like there's different ways to approach it, but usually the format I suggest is problem, solution, like problem, how you solve it today. Here's how it could be the IPO question. So it's, do you have this problem? Yes or no. If they say no, stop talking. They like, don't try to convince them that they have it. Mm -hmm. They say yes. Go, Cool. Here's how I think some people are solving it today. Spreadsheets, script, integration, Zapier, WooFoo, whatever. They go, yeah, yeah, I agree that I have friends that do it that way. Is there anything that we've missed? And then let them answer because your customers know way more about their problems and how they've solved it in the past than you can ever imagine. Yeah. Right. So they'll give you the things that you haven't thought about. Right. Other competitors, other techniques, whatever. And the third one is, here's how I think it could be solved. And you explain your product or solution, ideally, they don't know it's your product, right? So if you're doing early customer development, I can't hide anymore. People know it's clarity. It's me. Yeah. Early days, though, you can say, and I did this, was I have a friend working on this idea, and, and he's asked me to help him kind of, you know, go to get some feedback on it. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? Yeah. Then the feedback was honest and true, not, Dan, I think your idea sucks. It's, hey, your friend should probably think about this and this, and I don't agree with that. And I was like, oh, perfect. I'll let him know. But it was me. Yeah, I love that. You know, I think sometimes people need those like kind of key phrases. And the two that kind of stuck out to me are uh, so at, at the, pro the solution phase saying, uh, here's an idea of how it could be solved. That, and then I have a friend working on this. What do you think about it? I think that's, that's, that's a great idea. I could see how that might get more honest answers. It's real because there's no cost to them to tell you the honest in that situation, but there's all the cost in the world. To say, it, it comes down to the same psychology of like why like getting somebody to pay for your solution is true customer validation. The reason why is because there's real cost to them to not pay or pay. But mm -hmm. for them to ask somebody, it's like, hey, would you use this? And they say yes or no. They're going to say yes because they're kind, especially Canadians. And you know this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, totally. That's great. That was a great idea. You should build that. And so you go off for six months and spend, you know, 100 hours a week for six months building something, come back to them and go, oh, that's really nice. Uh, yeah, we don't really do it that way. But uh, yeah, good luck. You know, yeah. and you're like, what the hell? Yeah. Right? Same thing. If you're doing customer development, right off the bat, you should try to figure out how, how you it's not your idea. So it's like, Hey, my friend's doing this thing. And early days you can do that because they haven't seen you tweet about it. They haven't seen it on your bio. They haven't, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you can do these customer and you, and you can still do those after the fact uh, on, on product, uh, like specific product features, right? So like, for instance, if I had uh, a specific type of feature that's, you know, it's still in the phone, but let's say it's around discovery or like, hey, I think that people would do X, Y, and Z. I could just pick up the phone and call my friends and be like, hey, my friends are working on this new startup that's trying to do this, this, and this. And here's how he thinks he's going to solve it. What do you think? And that feedback is for my product feature, but it's, mm -hmm. I'm pretending it's somebody else. And, and it's really honest because they're not going to be mean and, and poo-poo my idea because they their social capital at, at risk that they just don't, it's not worth them saying that sucks. I do it because I know how important it is. He yeah. does it. Andrew Chen does it. There's yeah. a handful of people that I turn to personally because I know they're going to be honest and real. And I don't have time for people to, you know, as Mark Suster calls it, grin fuck people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My word is. Yeah. Okay. Rounding off this part here. I want to get to some questions about business, creating business. 
let's talk about creating a real business because this is something I've struggled with because in the startup space, um, there's it seems to be a lot of kind of products out there that don't seem like real businesses to me because they don't um, have profits. How, how do you def- – sorry? What do you, and give me a couple examples so I can use those in my answer. Oh, sure. Um, well, Twitter right now is trying to figure out profitability. Uh, Facebook is starting to get revenue, and but you know there's a lot of money in that company. Price to earnings would seem a little bit low. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that have a product uh, and they have revenue, but they might not have profits. Mm-hmm. So the question is, what's your definition of a real business? At what point do you become a real business? Well, I think the, the the business becomes a real business when it actually makes money. You know, create and keep a customer is the definition of a business, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so create and keep means you got and you retain, and then customer means they actually paid you, not user, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Instagram didn't have a business model. Their customer would have been advertising agencies. Twitter, same thing, right? Mm-hmm. And what people, especially not in the Valley, and I didn't understand when I first moved down there is um, there's a – the proxy to revenue is retention, right? Or growth. So there's certain businesses like a PayPal, like a Twitter, like a Facebook, et cetera, that is a land grab, right? Mm-hmm. There's only going to be a number one, maybe a number two. And I need to really spend all my time becoming number one and getting the brand recognition and distribution. And mm-hmm. that's why people raise capital. Now, if Twitter, if Twitter had a, a – and, and that's, that was Twitter's problem for a long time is people would sign up and they wouldn't use it, right? How many people had Twitter accounts, and it's like, I signed up for Twitter, and I haven't used it in two years. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, it made sense, right? Yeah. So Twitter knew that. They had these numbers they saw where people were like, these people really got it, and these people didn't, but we know what the problem is, and we're going to work on fixing it, right? But their challenge as well was the scaling issue, where they were spending most of their time and resources just trying to keep the site up because they were growing so fast. Um, but that that so the proxy of retention is in lieu of revenue Mm -hmm. because if you you can just assume right and andrew chen did a great blog post about like if you want to build a um um, you know a media property or a site that's going to monetize using advertising here's the kind of traffic that you need on a monthly basis to even be somewhat remotely interesting yeah i don't think people understand that so instagram no business they never charge for revenue but their growth and retention was through the roof Mm-hmm. So just using really bad average CPMs for ads, they were a really big, interesting business. Not to, you know, not, not putting aside the fact that they probably could unsat Facebook as a social network because Facebook requires language. Instagram is images, meaning that I'm friends with people in Japan that I'm not friends on Facebook. Which, yeah. That's what interesting. Yeah. Because the language, it's not Twitter. Do, so do you think that you, you think that Twitter could easily become a profitable business? A hundred, they, they will be. They're just building the see the the if so. The, how how do I explain it? Facebook was doing twenty million a year in revenue back when anybody remembers in the college days when they had banner ads. Twenty okay. million a year in banner ads. Zuckerberg said, "Take the banner ads because it screws up the experience, and we'll figure it out later." Mm-hmm. Right. And he did, and, he, and they became Facebook, a $100 billion company. Twitter, early days of Twitter, had AdSense. If you look back at the very first YouTube video, Jack Dorsey demoing Twitter, when he said, and this is a tweet, there's an AdSense ad on the tweet page. So hmm. He took it away. They knew that they could monetize. Is that the right experience? Does that create a great product experience? Hell no. Hmm. So but, what they all decided was, when we feel like we finally – locked in spot number one or two for our category, then we're going to try to figure out a way to monetize the product that enhances the experience. That's what's hard. There's only one company that I know that's called Google that their ads are better than their link sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what all these companies are trying to figure out. Yeah. So, but you don't think there's a question mark as to whether they will figure it out. You, you think they will figure it out sometime? No, there is a question mark, but that's why it's risk capital. It has to be a question mark. It can't gotcha. be certain. It can't be guaranteed. If it's guaranteed, they're not going to get the 100x returns. Their investors aren't going to get the 100 billion IPO on, on the stock market. Like, That's the whole game they're playing. It's not yeah. a 
a service business or I, I build houses or real estate play, it's, you know, there's, there's obviously risk, but that's why they're, they're, they're selling small portions of their company for a higher valuation because they're buying into the future. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking me, do I think that Twitter can be a hundred billion? They're valued at six right now for sure. Because Facebook is, and Twitter I think is fundamentally a more meaningful platform. It's protocol. It's, it's, it's almost like the internet. It's like TCP IP. Mm -hmm. Inter right. and, and so with Clarity, are you pursuing something similar or what's your strategy Bigger. for growth Bigger. with Clarity? Bigger than Twitter. Bigger. Bigger. Look, Google indexed the internet and made every text document available by search. Mm -hmm. I want to do that for people's brain. So you want to be, you want to be as big as Google, as big as, big, as Bigger. big as Facebook? Bigger even. Think about it. The internet, the internet's fun, but I got to sit there and I got to read. Yeah. I want, I want Google, but talk to the person so they can teach me in 10 minutes what I would have took two or three hours to read and understand. And I probably would have understood it wrong because we all know everybody on this. The reason why people are listening to this podcast is because conversations carry a lot more information than text. Mm -hmm. There's context. There's, there's, there's the person's background and who they are and what they've done. Right. I think that voice and conversation, and I'm not, I don't, I don't want to pretend for one minute that none of the big guys are thinking about this, but mm -hmm. I think clarity is uniquely positioned to actually go after this opportunity. But yeah, it's going to be huge. Huh. So just to, to kind of close off, for uh, any of our listeners that are, you know, they're, they want to build their first product, what advice would you give them uh, for someone, to someone who's trying to build their first product? Build a landing page with some mock-ups of, like, try to build, like, a one-pager, a one right? Visual, like, maybe it's, like, the, the benefit statement, the name of the product, some screenshots, right? PDF or a website, doesn't matter, a link. <laughs> Okay. And try to find ten people to buy you, buy it from you. Try to find ten people who will pay you. Give you money, dollar bills. Interesting. See, th and this is where you're different from, kind of a lot of the other startup talk. Is uh, I'm not though. But then, because what I would say after that is, depending on the opportunity, maybe you don't want to charge anymore because it's a land grab. See, that's the thing. It's right, uh, right on. Eric Reese talks about this. Yeah. Clarity, like who knows what the business model will be for clarity. Maybe I stop, maybe I stop taking the 15% that we take today because it's not important, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a success tax, right? Why do I want to do a success tax for my experts? I don't. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm trying to say is Eric Reese was the one that taught me right time, right action. There's things mm -hmm. you should do today to validate that you would maybe stop later because you've proved it. And that would be an example depending on the opportunity in the market. So why do I think clarity is important? It's because I don't think anybody actually knows. And the best way to find out is to talk to people who have been there before and you'll learn faster. And information economy, everybody agrees we're in this world, 60% of the workforce are information workers and that's growing. The only thing that's gonna make us compete better faster is to be able to learn faster, make faster, better decisions. Mm -hmm. So so for you, the, my advice. If, if you can validate that people will pay for something, Depending on the idea, you could say, "Well, I know people will pay for this. Now we can we can actually turn that part down for a while and grow this important. thing." If you're bootstrapping, then you actually need to do the opposite and say, "How much can I get people to pay for it?" Because <laughs> I don't have that much runway. Right? Where's the yield pricing? Where's the curve? Talk to Jason Cohen on Clarity for that advice. He knows it best. Yeah. Right. So and if you were, like, if you were bootstrapping, yeah. If you were bootstrapping, what, how would your your uh, how would the steps be different? I mean, this is the context part that you don't get reading Hacker News, right? How would it be different? A, you would probably wouldn't quit your day job until mm -hmm. you actually validated it. Once you validated it, then the next thing I would do is figure out what's what's the highest I could get for it because I need to get the highest margin initially so that I can somewhat get to a point where I'm like covering my cost. Let's say two thousand a month yeah. right, to live. And then I want to, as fast as possible, actually validate, because here's the other part that you didn't validate is you went in front of somebody and got them to pay you. Cool. 
they looked at you, you communicated well, but that's not your business. Your business is, will this person, not knowing me, show up to a website, feel the pain that I think they have, go on Google to try to find a solution, find my solution, and buy at the same price. Mm-hmm. That's a different step. Yeah, that's an important one. You actually don't hear about that as much, uh, no. especially with customer development. Hmm. I was talking to an entrepreneur yesterday, and they're like, look, we just closed $12,000. We had we have six $12,000 a year plans that we got, and we're building this product. And I said, congratulations, but it doesn't mean shit, because every one of those customers were your previous customers at your service company. Mm-hmm. So they've already paid to trust you. They know you. They've gotten the product, and all you said is, hey, you can do this yourself using our tool. The only validated learning to me, and I told them this, is, Go and try to put your product in front of people and see if they even get to a level of gratification because the way it looked that day was it sucked because every product sucks in the beginning anyways. Mm -hmm. Nobody's, right? So those are all like, what are the riskiest, Heaton, right? I don't want to like, you know, kind of like, these are the guys. These are the guys who taught me. Heaton always says, what's the riskiest assumption that you believe that if it doesn't prove true, your business does not work? It's not the technology. Maybe yeah. it is. Maybe you're in a. Maybe you're trying to build some new search engine, and maybe it's the technology. But that's not more than for ninety percent, ninety five percent of people out there. It's should you build it? Does anybody actually want it? Yeah. And you don't need to yeah. build anything to learn that. And what do you think is a good profit margin for a bootstrap company? As much as you can get. get what's the baseline? You know, the, it, it all depends. Like it depends who the customer is. Like you can actually, you can get people to pay five thousand dollars a month if you generate thirty thousand dollars of value. Mm-hmm. So, so if I said fifty bucks, I'd be d- doing a disservice to the people that could have got five thousand. Mm-hmm. It all depends. How much pain does the customer have, and uh, what's the value of a solution if it was solved in a way that they would actually use? Yeah. If you're if you're selling Boeing jets and you're profit on a jet is $12 million and I have a tool that lets you sell 20% more jets per year, you better believe you're paying seven, eight figures for my solution. Exactly. Because that, because the ROI for you is three or five or seven X. <laughs> it's all different. It all depends on the customer, the market, the product set, the problem. And you know, but again, the biggest challenge is, is any, it's not, can you build it? Should you build it? That's probably a good place to uh, to leave it. Hey, uh, Dan, thanks so much for coming on the show. No, Justin, absolutely my pleasure. If anybody wants to reach out to me directly, they can email me at dan at clarity.fm. Short emails, please, because I don't read long ones, as I said earlier. Dan <laughs> Martell on Clarity, so clarity.fm slash Dan Martell, and uh, at Dan Martell on Twitter. You know, tweet at me, I tweet back, and love to hear from you. Beautiful. Thanks again, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, Justin, thanks again. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening. If you like this show, you can rate us on iTunes. Just search for Product People and click five stars. That really helps the show get noticed. We've just been featured in What's Hot for iTunes under Business and Management. So thanks to everyone that have given us ratings so far. You can follow Dan Martell on Twitter at Dan Martell. You can follow me, Justin, on Twitter at MIJustin. And you can follow the show on Twitter as well, at Product People TV. Join us next week where we take a break from bootstrapping and we try to look at things from another perspective. Jason Calacanis is on the show to talk about funding versus bootstrapping. Join us then.
Hey, is this on? All right, I promised you guys an Easter egg. Here it is. A little bit embarrassing, but if you search Canadian selfie in Google Images, my picture is the first result that shows up. Cheers. Podcast hosting is provided by Transistor.fm. They host our MP3 files, generate our RSS feed, provide us with analytics, and help us distribute the show to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. If you want to start your own podcast or you want to switch to Transistor, go to Transistor.fm slash Justin and get 15% off your first year.